Welcome. We will be covering the cash chapter today, and this chapter will consist of three sections. We will talk about cash shortage and overage, as well as petty cash, and then we'll end up with a section on your checking uh, procedures. So a business must maintain an adequate cash flow. However, the type of cash receipts that are received, it depends on the nature of the business and how your business is conducted. In accounting, when we refer to cash, we refer to currency, we refer to coins, checks, money orders, and funds on deposits in a bank. And cash receipts come in a variety of forms for a typical business. So, for example, supermarkets may receive checks as well as currency and coins. Department stores also receive checks in the mail from charge account customers in addition to currency and coins. And the wholesalers usually receive cash in the form of checks when they're selling items to their customers. Now, when cash receipts are um, occasionally, we have errors. When we're exchanging cash in your business, that is, um, it may be a transaction entering error, or it may be your employee giving out the wrong amount of cash uh, when dealing with transactions. So the cash in the cash register is either more or less than the cash listed on the cash register tape. And so when cash receipts are more than the sales, we call that a overage or another way of saying that cash is over. And when cash receipts are less than the sales, we call that a shortage or cash is short. So these errors sometimes occur when employees are making change. So how do we account for cash shortage or overage? Sometimes there's a shortage. Sometimes there's an overage. It all depends on the day, on the specific day and how cash is collected. However, we need to account for this during the month. So we will be using a new account called cash short or over in order to account for the shortages or overages in your cash. So cash tends to be uh, short more often than over because customers are more likely to notice and complain if they receive too little change. So they will come back and ask for their um, missing money. So cash short or over amounts are recorded in the cash short or over account. And usually we will be crediting or we will have a credit balance in the account if it's an overage and that is treated as revenue. And similarly, if there is a debit balance in the account, then there's a shortage. So when we have an overage, we will be doing having a credit balance and when we will be um having a shortage, there will be a debit balance. Here's an example on, on uh, how to calculate cash short, cash short at the end of the trading day. So we have a company called uh, Royal Jewelry Store and on September 29, the change fund was $200. And when I mean by change fund, Usually a business keeps a certain amount of money in the cash register at the end of the day and will begin the next day with that same amount of money. And that is used in order to have some money available to provide change to your customer. So on September 29th, the change fund was $200 and the cash sales at the end of the day amounted to $2,200. So when you close the register at the end of the day, you as a business owner should expect $2,400 in cash. However, when the cash was actually counted, it could have been by you or an employee, you find out that there's only $2,397 in the cash register. You're supposed to have $2,400, but only $2,397 were found in the cash register. So this tells you that the cash register was short by $3, correct? And so this is how the journal entry should look like in order to record the sales and the cash shortage. And in this case, there's a shortage. And so the cash short or over account is debited for $3. So what we will do is we'll add the date, we'll debit our cash by 
our cash account by $2,197, which is actually the amount that was found in the cash register. We know that the cash register was short by $3, so we will be debiting that. And then we will credit our sales account by $2,200. So what this is showing is that we had two, this amount of cash in the register. We know that it was short $3 because our sales actually amounted to $2,200. And then we add our little description. And again, the description needs to be as long or short as it needs to be for you to know what this transaction was for. So this is uh, to record sales and cash shortage. Here's an example on how to calculate cash over at the end of the day. So for the same company, now it's the next day, September 30th, the same change fund was $200. So the cash register opened up with $200 in the cash register and the sales was um, an amount of $2,100. So this tells you that at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you should expect $2,300 in the cash register. However, when it was closed, the cash count was $2,301. So the cash was over by $1 in this case. So we will need to record the overage computed on the previous slide. And the cash short or over account is credited for $1. And after these journal entries have been posted, the balance in the cash short or over account on September 30th is $2. And this will be reported as an expense on the income statement for the period ended of September 30th. So this is what the general journal will look like for September 30th. We have a debit of cash for $2,101, which is the amount of dollars that we found in the cash register. We know that this is over by $1, so we will credit our cash short or overage account by $1. And then we will credit the sales by 2100 which is actually our actual sales that was recorded on the registered tape. And that's to record the sales and the cash overage. Now remember that the general journal is like your uh, main record where you post all the transactions in one place. However, you need to translate that information to the general ledger by accounts. So this is what the general ledger will look like for the cash short or overage account. We will start with September 29th, where we know that we had an overage of $3, so it's debited. And so our balance at the end of the day is $3. However, on September 30th, we know that we had an overage of $1, so that was credited. So now our balance for our cash short or over is by $2. So overall, the business has only lost $2 because we lost $3 in one day, but we made up $1 by having a cash overage on the next day. Now, uh, generally, a business makes sales on account and bills customers once after a specific period. It could be a specific month. And so what happens is that the company will send a statement of account that shows the transactions that were made during the month and the balance that is owed. Typically, just uh, think about your credit cards if you have one. You will get a statement at the end of the month that will show you all the transactions, whether you've charged more things to the credit card or you've made payments, and then it will give you a balance that is owed to the credit card company. Same concept. So checks from credit customers are journalized and posted and then the checks are deposited in the bank. So we that's the way are recording our payments that have been made to the business. Now, a promissory note provides a more legal protection than an account receivable. And the next slide will show you a promissory note. So a promissory note is a written promise to pay a specific amount of money on a certain date. And usually the promissory notes are specified interest bearing notes and they are used by businesses to extend credit. And they also use that to replace an account's receivable balance when an account is overdue. Think about promissory notes if you have student loans. Before they give you 
your loan check, you will have to sign a promissory note that states that you are in compliance and in agreement with all the stipulations that the um, company has set forth in order for you to get that money for your usage. Sometimes promissory notes are issued on account to satisfy an overdue account. And here's a promissory note accepted for one business, Max Out Sporting Goods. And the note is due in six months and the customer will have to pay the interest at the rate of 9% on the amount of $800. And this is what it will look like. It's for $800 for six months after this date the company promises to pay or the customer promises to pay the max out sporting goods eight hundred dollars uh payable to first texas bank with interest at nine percent and it's due january 31st 2016. this is a journal entry in the general journal to record the receipt of the note for the customer that owed $800. And this is sometimes referred to as a conversion journal entry. And so um, what we have is the asset account, the notes receivable, they were both debited. Um, so we have the date, we have notes receivable as debited for $800. And it's uh, for our, let's look at the previous slide. It doesn't have a note. Does it? No, it doesn't. But this is where you would probably put the note number, of the promissory note number. And then we will uh, credit the accounts receivable for Stacy Fairley for $800, which was to um, receive a six-month 9% note from Stacy Fairley to replace an open account. Okay. So that's how you transferred it in order uh, from accounts receivable to a promissory note. Now at the end of the note, we will need to compute the interest, right? Because we said that you owe us $800. We will give you a certain amount of time to pay us back, but you will pay an interest rate of 9%. So the interest on the note, when you figure that out, it will be $36. Remember, you just multiply the amount owed times 9%. That will give you the percentage. Um, the interest on that amount, which is $36. And so the total amount due upon the, upon the maturity of the note will not be $800. It will be $800 plus the interest, which is $36. So at the end of the maturity note, um, you, the person will owe $836 to the company. Okay, now that is it for cash overage or cash shortage pretty simple. It's just making sure that you make sure that you record any overages or shortages that are found in the crash register when you're closing it because that's also stuff that you need to record because it could either be revenue for you or it could be an expense for you when you have a deficit in your cash register and all that stuff is useful when you're doing your taxes. In the second sec section of this chapter we're going to talk about procedures for petty cash fund and the internal control routines for cash. Now, uh, remember, for good internal control, all cash payments should be made by a check, okay? Petty cash funds are set up to make payments for purchases of small items like postage, postage items, um, and a fund is established by writing a check to the order of the person who will be in charge of the fund. Usually the office manager, the cashier, or the assistant is in charge of the petty cash fund. And so there should be a pre-numbered voucher, which is good, is a good usage for internal control, and the amount is recorded. And the purpose of the fund is listed. And the account which needs to be debited is written along with its account number. So what is a petty cash fund again? So you should try to always use your checks in order to make payments, to record and have a legal way of recording your transactions um, to know what money is coming out of your business. But sometimes having um, cash on hand is a good way 
to pay for small things that may come up throughout the day of your business. <clears throat> it may not be feasible to write a check right away. Perhaps if you have a small business but has a, a, a department in charge of cutting out checks and you have a procedure established that that check is not cut out on the same day or as a matter of fact in, the, in a number of minutes, it perhaps takes a day or a few hours but then you have somebody delivering something to you that is less than $50 and you need to pay that person on the spot, it's not, um, it may not be feasible for you to be writing a check or waiting for a check. So this is where the petty cash fund comes into play. But in order for you to put um, or establish a petty cash fund, you will need to write a check, okay? So this is what the petty cash voucher looks like and this is, um, um, to add the description, it could be for office supplies, and in this case, it's um, you are going to charge sixteen dollars and twenty five cents from the petty cash fund to pay for some supplies that were delivered. Okay, so how do we establish the fund? Here's an example of the establishment of a petty cash fund for the business called Max Out Sporting Goods. And what happened here is that the business wrote a check for $175 to the cashier on February 1st using check number 160. Okay, the amount of the fund depends on the business. It could be um, $200, $50, whatever it is. And the cashier is, is responsible for the petty cash fund since the check was written to that person. And then the establishment of the petty cash fund should be recorded as follows in the general journal. It is on the date. You would debit petty cash by $175. And then you would credit our cash account by $175. Remember, you're taking cash out, giving it to your cashier to hold and be responsible for. And this is to establish a petty cash fund using check number 160. Now, most businesses use a petty cash analysis sheet to record transactions involving petty cash. In addition to the main column receipts and payments, the analysis sheet also contains special columns for accounts that are used frequently and in other accounts debit column for entries that do not fit in a special column. So they're used to record transactions involving petty cash. It contains two major columns, receipts and payments, and it may contain special columns such as supplies, delivery expense, and miscellaneous expenses for those that don't apply to the other two accounts, and other accounts debit columns for entries that do not fit in the special column. So you know how to establish a, um, a petty cash fund, but how do you replenish it? So the total vouchers... Remember, you're going to write vouchers for every time that you use your petty cash fund. So the total vouchers plus the cash on hand should always equal the amount of the cash fund, of the petty cash fund. So the fund should be replenished at the end of each month or sooner if the fund is low. So, for example, we recorded a transaction to establish a petty cash fund for $175. And let's say that throughout the month, there are vouchers amounting to $25. So at the end of the month, you should have vouchers for $25, plus you should still have cash for $150. So cash for $150 plus the vouchers for $25 equals $175, which equals the amount of the petty cash fund that was established. Okay? And so if the petty cash fund is not running too low, then at the end of the month, um, you will reconcile that and then you will replenish the account by $25 in order to bring up the balance to $175. However, if in the middle of the month you have $5 left, then that's where the sooner comes in and you need to replenish the fund sooner in order to bring it back up to $175. This slide shows an example of the petty cash analysis sheet. And the total payments during the month are replenished at the end of the month or when needed 
when when the total amount of payments are made okay so here's what it looks like we have the date column we have the voucher number okay and then we have all the transactions here so for example on February 1st we established a, a petty cash fund for hundred and seventy five dollars right we wrote a check so we have a receipt for hundred and seventy five dollars however during the month the petty cash fund was used to pay for all of these transactions here so with voucher number one they paid office supplies amounting to sixteen dollars and twenty five cents okay so we have the supplies debit for uh, sixteen dollars and twenty five cents then we had a delivery service and that cost twenty four dollars so that was voucher number uh, number two for twenty four dollars um, then we had a withdrawal for twenty five dollars we had we paid for postage stamps for thirty seven dollars we had delivery service for $17.50. We had window washing for $26 and other supplies for $14. And notice that after the, the payments are in one column, but also they're separated by the type of transaction that it was. Was it for debits, for supplies? Was it for delivery expenses? Or was it for something else? Like something else was the window washing. And then you'll have the totals column, the totals row, I'm sorry where you would actually add up all of these columns here together. And you know that um, at the end of the day, you should have $175 on both on both ends here because you know you established a receipt, a petty cash fund for $175 and you did all of these transactions, okay, plus any balance that is left over in the account and it should equal to $175, okay? And this talks about the balance on hand, which is $15.25. And so in order to replenish the fund back to $175, we need to replenish the fund by $159.75. So in internal controls for petty cash include using only for small payments. And so the amount is limiting and you do not write checks to cash. So the following internal procedures apply to petty cash. You use a petty cash fund only for small payments that cannot conveniently be made by check. You limit the amount set aside for petty cash to the approximate amount needed to cover one's month payments from the fund. And then you write a, a petty cash fund check to the person in charge of the fund, not to the order of cash. So once you determine who will be responsible for that cash, uh, petty cash fund, you will write the cash, the check to that person. Other internal control procedures include assigning it to one person's responsibility, keeping cash secure, and obtaining vouchers for payment to provide an audit trail. So always assign one person to control the petty cash fund. This person has the sole responsibility and control of the money and is the only one authorized to make payments from the fund. Okay? Always keep your petty cash in a safe, a locked cash box, or a locked drawer, and obtain a petty cash voucher for each payment. That is the way that you are going to reconcile that account. The vouchers should be assigned by the person who receives the money and should show the payment details, which provides you an audit trail for the fund. So in case you get audited by the IRS, you know how to, you have proof, you have evidence. Now, um, the internal control over cash should be tailored to the needs of a business. Accountants play a vital role in designing, establishing, and monitoring the cash control system. So take a look of, over the above steps and see if you can understand the importance of these controls. So um, you have only designated employees receive and handle cash. And some businesses, employees handling cash are bonded or, you know, they have some kind of insurance. Keep cash receipts in a cash register, a locked cash drawer, or a safe while they are on the premises, and they make a record of all the cash receipts as the funds come into the business.
Okay, other controls also include depositing receipts promptly and entering receipt transactions promptly. So check the funds to be deposited against the record made when the cash was received. Step number five, you deposit the cash receipts in the bank promptly and you deposit the fund intact. Then step number six, you enter cash receipt transactions in the accounting records promptly and then you have the monthly bank statement sent to and reconciled by someone other than the employees who handled, recorded, and deposited the funds. This goes back to the previous chapters where we had the internal controls where you only assign um, certain tasks to certain people and you separate separate the, um, the tasks so that there's less likely um, the possibility of fraud. Now, one of the advantages of an efficient procedure for handling and recording cash receipts is that the funds uh, reach the bank sooner and cash receipts are not kept on the premises for more than a short time, which means that the funds are safer and are readily available for paying bills owed by the firm. And the, um, there are simple routines a business can put in place to provide better control over the cash payment, including issuing checks only when an approved bill or invoice is presented. Okay. And then comparting the canceled checks to the checkbook or register during the bank reconciliation process. So you will have another person sign and mail the check to the creditors. You will use pre number checks forms. And during the bank reconciliation process, you compare the canceled checks to the checkbook or cash register, and then you enter promptly in the accounting records all the cash payment transactions. And that is it for section two for petty cash funds. Pretty easy. So the first section was on cash overage and cash shortage, then how to establish and replenish a um, petty cash fund. So the last one is on banking procedures. This is the last section of this chapter and it addresses reconciling a bank statement and it explains how businesses can use online banking to manage cash activities. So objective four discusses proper banking procedures involving checks, deposits, and maintaining a checkbook. So let's talk about checks first. A check is written... Um, is a written order signed by an authorized person instructing a bank to pay a specific sum of money to a designated person or business and the drawer is the person that the person that draws out is a person or firm issuing a check and the draw e is the bank on which the check is written and the pay e is a person or firm to whom the check is payable to so here are two checks. The first check is um, to max out sporting goods was written for two months rent equaling $1,500. So see if you can identify the parties on a check as previously described. And keep in mind that a check is a negotiable instrument and a financial is instrument is, an, is negotiable if ownership can be transferred to another person or a business. So usually business checks has this little uh, tear out uh, tab here that you see on the left hand side, which will be the record that you keep. Or um, nowadays they come carbon copies where you could actually tear out the check on the top of your record of the exact same check as a carbon copy on the bottom. And it's to the pay order of Carter Real Estate for $1,500 and that is rent for January. Okay. And then we also have another one for the Retail Equipment Center for $2,400, and that's for store fixtures. And notice here a nice feature is that it uh, gives you another way of, of identifying how much money you should be having in the cash account. It started with $12,025.50, $12 and you wrote a check for $1,500, so now you should have $10,000. $525.50 and then you wrote another check for $2,400 so now in actuality you have $8,125.50 so that's a nice way of having another checkpoint when reconciling your records. Now the check stub will show the balance before the check was written 
and the balance in the checking account after the check is subtracted. And to be valid, checks need an authorized signature. So for Max Out Sporting Goods, only Max Ferraro, the owner, is authorized to sign the checks. And debit cards, also um, called check cards, look like credit cards or ATM cards, um, but operate just like cash or a personal check. Okay? Endorsements. An endorsement is a written authorization that transfers ownership of a check. So there are three types of endorsements. We have a, a blank endorsement, a full endorsement, a restrictive endorsement. So make sure you know the difference between the three. So the deposit slip for Max Out Sporting Goods shows the date of January 8th. Um, give me a second here. Yeah, so, okay, let's move on. Just wanted to make sure that I wasn't skipping anything else that I needed to talk to you about. Um, so the deposit slip for Max Al Sporting Goods shows the date of January 8th. We have currency. Uh, currency is the paper money for $1,810, okay, up here. Then we have coin is the amount uh, in coins. So we have $219.80. And the checks and money orders are individually listed right here. Some banks ask that the um, American Bankers Association transit number for each check be entered on a deposit slip. And the transit number appears on the top part of the fraction that appears in the upper right hand corner of the check. And so the transaction, the transit number is one, um, it's right here, 1210 slash 8640. Now you know what these little numbers are for and what they're used for. So occasionally a business will receive a post dated check, and a post dated check is dated sometime in the future. And so if the business receives a post dated check, it should not be deposited before the date on the check. Otherwise, the check will be refused by the bank, um, and you will have uh, you will have it returned to you, which will cost you money if there's fees attached to it. So, objective number five is to prepare a bank reconciliation. That is actually just making sure that your records match what's what the bank is telling you. That um, in terms of the amount of money that you should have in the account. This is done by comparing the bank statements to the account records maintained by your company. So the bank reconciliation reconciles the two balances. Sometimes the difference between the bank balance and the book balance is due to errors. Sometimes the error is due to timing. So it's important to understand the basic type of reconciling terms. We have uh, errors made by banks. We have the arithmetic errors. They usually give credit to the wrong depositor or they are charging a check against the wrong account. And then there are errors that are made by the business, which are arithmetic errors on your part as well. Not recording a check or a deposit or recording a check or deposit for the wrong amount. And so many banks require that errors in the bank statements be reported within a short amount of period, usually 10 days. So you need to keep up with your records in order for you not to lose a chance to claim something that is for your in your favor. Other than errors, there are four reasons why the book balance of cash may not agree with the balance on the bank statement. It is important that you know the definition of each of these and how they would be recorded on a typical bank reconciliation. So um, outstanding checks are checks that have been recorded in the cash payments journal, but have not yet been paid by the bank. Deposit and transit is the deposit that is recorded in the cash receipts journal, but that reaches the bank too late to be shown on your monthly bank statement. 
Okay, so you just crossing information you, that in, information is is missed. And then there's service charges and other deductions not recorded in the business records. And then there's deposits such as the collection of a promissory note not recorded in the business records. So here's the format of a typical bank reconciliation. You have the first section and the second section. So when the bank statement does not equal the book balance, okay? So this is what you will do. Um, in the first section, you will add the deposits in transit. You would minus any outstanding checks, or you would add or delete any bank errors, okay? And in the second section, you would add the deposits that are not recorded yet, minus any deductions or any errors in the books on your part, whether it uh, gives you money or deletes money. And so at the end of the bank reconciliation, you should have an, an adjusted bank balance as well as an adjusted book balance. Why is it adjusted? For the reasons I just mentioned before. Um, you know, there are outstanding checks that have not been posted yet by the bank. There are deductions that you have not done or deposits that you have not recorded on your end. So whatever the bank statement is telling you and your records that you have on hand are two different numbers. So you have to reconcile them in order to come up with an adjusted balance that equals both um, your records and the bank records. And that's why we have an adjusted balance, just to make sure that nothing is an error yet. It's just that things have not been posted yet in terms of timing. So there's timing errors. So let's prepare the first section. First, enter the end of month bank statements balance listed on the bank statement, and then compare the deposits in the checkbooks with the deposits on the bank statement. And then next, list the outstanding checks. So if the bank has incorrectly debited an account or omitting any other errors, you should list those, and then you finally compute the adjusted bank balance. And so now it's time to prepare the second section of the bank reconciliation. So you first enter the balance in the books from the cash account. Second, you total and record any deposits made by the bank um, that have not been recorded in the accounting records. Then you record the deductions made by the bank, for example, a service charge. And then next you record any errors uncovered during the reconciliation process. And then you finally compute the, um, adjust, the adjusted book balance. And then remember that the adjusted balance, bank balance and the adjusted book balance should balance. Okay, you should have uh, equal numbers there. In the bank reconciliation process, steps two and three in section two involve recording additions or deductions made by the bank that are not yet included in the accounting records, and journal entries must be prepared to account for these items. So for max out sporting goods, two entries must be made. You debit the accounts receivable for NSF check or non-sufficient funds from David Newhouse and credit the cash account. And then you debit bank, bank fees expense for the monthly bank charges and credit card, credit cash for the same uh, amount of $25. And in the above entry, the two charges are entered as one adjustment entry. Okay, so you have the date, you have the description, you have a debit uh, for the accounts uh, received for $525. And then you are going to debit your bank fees expense for $25. And then you're going to credit your uh, cash account for $550. And that's to record NSF check and service charge. NSF is non-sufficient funds. So when a check bounces. All right, we're at the end. So more and more businesses are managing a significant portion of their cash transactions online. So online banking offers an efficient feature, including electronic fund transfers, payments for taxes to government agencies, receipts or EFT payments from customers and payments to vendors. And there are usually no source documents for the transactions listed above. So be careful 
you need to have careful attention and must be paid in order to ensure that all EFT and other transactions initiated electronically are recorded in the accounting records, okay? But it's a tool that it's available to you and that's the way that we are going in the future. But it's also good to know all of this on um, how to do it manually in order for you to know how to reconcile your, your funds for your business and make sure that you're not losing any money. And that is it for this section. It's a pretty um, long section, a pretty long chapter. However, the sections are fairly simple. You just need to learn how to record a cash overage or a shortage. You need to know how to establish a petty cash fund and replenish it. And then, um, you know, you need to know how to reconcile your bank statements, which is just um, making sure that you compare your records with the bank statement records. And that is all for this chapter. Let me know if you have any questions. Good luck to you.